One year ago tomorrow, I stood before you for the very first time, and I made a promise. And that promise was that if you would have me, I would be honored to come serve. And that I would do everything within my ability to leave Lakeside better than I found it. That was the promise that I made to you a year ago tomorrow. As we here at Lakeside have this opportunity over the next five weeks to refine and to discuss very openly and honestly what drives us and something we're calling clarity, we're going to speak very specifically. We're going to speak very openly and very honestly. That's just my style. That's who I am. I'm somebody who's a straight shooter. You never have to guess what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling. And sometimes Brooke says, be careful. Because he'll tell you. <laughs> like, if you really, really want to know, you can ask him, but be careful, because <laughs> he's going to tell you. But before we talk about the next one to three years, I want to go back. I want to go back to the start, to the best of my understanding of Lakeside, and I want to go back even further than that, a couple thousand years, to an event that I believe communicates the heart of Jesus and an event I believe needs to communicate the heart of Lakeside. So if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along there. If not, don't freak out. It's all cool. You can follow along on the screens. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to see an encounter that Jesus had when we start in verse 9, where we read those, these words. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So we have this scene where Jesus is traveling through and he sees a tax collector. And I know this can be earth shattering, but believe it or not, there was a time that tax, collector, tax collectors weren't exactly the most popular of people. There was a time where people didn't like paying taxes and people really resented tax collectors. And not only did people not like paying taxes in this culture, but it was also a, a, it was also a pyramid scheme. Tax collectors could literally establish whatever taxation they wanted, and they would pay a portion to the government, and they would keep the rest for themselves. And so they would become personally enriched as a result of this line of work, and they could hide behind the role of being an official of the government. And so these are outcasts of society. These are people that society does not like. And Jesus walks past a tax collector. He looks at them, and he says, follow me, and he gives gets up and he leaves his riches behind, he leaves his position behind, and he follows after Jesus. And the story continues. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And so we, here we have a picture of God in flesh in Jesus, literally the holy of holies. Here is Jesus, and he is surrounded by people that society hates. And he is surrounded by people that have undoubtedly been dismissed and people did not want to associate with. And here is Jesus associating with those people. And here what we see is they are also associating and interacting with Jesus. People love to interact with Jesus. Do they love to interact with you? People love to interact with Jesus. Do they love to interact with you? Sometimes we can, under the guise of speaking the truth, we can, we can be very intentional about speaking the truth. And we can see things that, that happen in our society that we we say that doesn't align with God's plan for society. And it can be genuine from a place of love and concern that we want people to understand the truth and we want them to see the error that they find themselves in and how, they're, how, how their conduct looks contrary to, to what God would have them do. And that can all be born out of place of concern. And yet we can sometimes be really good about speaking the truth, but not so good about speaking the truth in love. 
And the question is, do people who disagree with you love to interact with you? Do people who you disagree with love to interact with you? Because we need to make sure that we're people not just that speak the truth and not just hold fast to the truth. And certainly we need to be people who speak the truth and hold fast to the truth. But we can't escape the fact that Scripture tells us to speak the truth in love. And that needs to be our guiding principle just as much as truth. It's not one or the other. It's not either or. It's a both and scenario. And this is personified in Jesus. We see it here. It needs to be personified to the best of our abilities in us as well. Not that we shy away from the truth, not that we're scared, but that we are always doing so in a spirit of love. People love to interact with Jesus. Do they love to interact with you? And when the Pharisees saw this, what was going on, when they saw that Jesus had called a tax collector, somebody who society hated because the tax collectors could legitimately victimize people in society, and they saw that this is somebody that Jesus is calling to follow him, and now Jesus is eating dinner at the house, and he's surrounded by these people, and he's surrounded by sinners. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. Why does your teacher do this? They can't fathom it. They can't understand it. Why out of everybody in society would Jesus choose to interact with these people when there are literally thousands of other people that Jesus could choose to interact with? He is choosing to interact with people that society on a whole wants nothing to do with and people that everybody looks at and knows their reputation. People that everybody looks at and says, "Mm, I know their story that are easily dismissed. The Pharisees see this, and they don't understand this. They can't fathom why he would do it. And not only that, but please understand. When Matthew talks about the tax collectors and the sinners at his house, he's talking about himself. Because the person who wrote this book is the man in the story. He knows his life. He knows the story of his friends. He knows what he's done. The Pharisees, they're coming in from the outsider's view. And they're turning up their nose. And they're judging. And they're condescending. And it's the idea of why would Jesus be with those people? with those people, condescending. Who are those people for you? Who are those people? Because we all know they exist. And because of our own bias or our own judgments, whatever the case may be, we all have the group of those people. And yet the heart of Jesus is to run right to those that society would cast off. It's to run right to those that everybody else would say, don't have a relationship with this person. Or don't you understand what this person's story is? Or do you know what this person is all about? And oh, by the way, here's the most dangerous aspect of all of this. When we become like the Pharisees and when we see people like those people, What happens is we turn a blind eye to our own faults. And we begin to push them down and elevate ourselves. But why would you associate with those people? What we're saying is we're superior. We're better. They're not as good as us. We're so much further along than they are. Jesus runs right to the heart of the outcast. 
He runs right to the heart of the people that the religious people would say, we want, we're not going to have anything to do with them because we know their story. We know what they're all about. And Jesus runs right to them. When he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick. Jesus says, forget the annual checkup at the doctor's office. Forget that. That's not when you need a doctor. You need a doctor when you're sick. That's the whole point. Jesus says, that's why I'm here. I'm here for the people who are sick. This is the heart of Jesus. I came for those who are sick. And let me tell you a little spoiler. That's all of us. And when we look at people with the eyes of condescension, or when we group them in and it's those people and the sinners, we lose sight of the fact that we need a physician too. And we have a problem. And our problems may look different than their problems. And our sin may look different than their sin. But it's still a problem. And it's still sin. And we desperately need a doctor just as much as them. Jesus says, I'm here for the sick. I'm here for the outcast. I'm here for the rejects. I'm here for everybody else that society would want nothing to do with. That's where I run. Because whether you realize it or not, that's you too. That's all of us. That's why Jesus came. Go and learn what this means, Jesus said. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the heart of Jesus. The, the reason Jesus came to this world was our redemption. And it is my fundamental belief that we as the church need to be passionate about the very same things that Jesus is passionate about. After all, he is why we're here. He is who we follow. He is who we elevate. He is who we worship. If Jesus reveals to us the heart of God, then the heart of God needs to be the very thing that we chase after. And if finding people and saving people is what makes the heart of God tick, then it needs to be what makes our hearts tick as well. We must be people who become more and more and more like Jesus. That is our aim. That is the whole reason that the moment we become redeemed, the moment we make the decision to follow Jesus, He just doesn't just take us to heaven instantaneously. No, not because God needs us, but because in God's magnificent plan, He chooses to utilize people such as ourselves who are broken and flawed and imperfect people to do his work. There is no greater privilege, there is no greater blessing in this world than a God who doesn't need us would choose to use us as broken and as flawed as an, and as imperfect as we are to accomplish his bidding and to accomplish his work for his glory. This is what drives us. This must be what drives because this is what drove the heart of Jesus. It's why at Lakeside, we exist to help people move one step closer to Jesus. 
and reach those who are far from you. At Lakeside, we exist to help people move one step closer to Jesus. And you're like, well, what does that mean? I mean, when do you ever arrive? You don't. You don't. I know some of you, you're, you're better than some others. I, I know that, but you ain't Jesus. <laughs> you're just not. Like, you might be like, I'm, pre- I'm feeling pretty good. You're not Jesus. This never ends. And when you start to think like, oh, I've become more like God in this area of my life. Congratulations. Now look at the other 67 areas of your life that's a, that are about to be revealed to you that you're like, I got a long way to go. But we're all there. And that's why we're here collectively. To encourage one another, to support one another, to challenge one another, to help one another. That's the point. This isn't a business. This is a community. We are a family. And every single one of us in our family have the weird aunt and uncle. We just do. And if you're like, for the life of me, I can't figure out who that is in my family. You're it. I'm sorry to reveal that to you. But if you're like, for the life of me, I just can't put my finger on who that could be in my family. It's you. All right? I'll just tell you. It's you. We all have it. You're like at Thanksgiving, like, oh, please don't make me get stuck to this person. I love them, but I really don't want them to spoil my... We all have those people. Guess what? We're a community. We're a family. We're going to have some weird people here at Lakeside. And guess what? We're going to love it. We exist to help people move one step closer to Jesus and reach those who are far from Him. Mission drives us. Mission drives us. And this is our mission. Now, let's be honest. The last six years of Lakeside have been challenging. They've been challenging. From July of 2012 to June of 2013, the average attendance of Lakeside was 217 people. From July 2013 to June 2014, the average attendance was 198. Year over year, that's a loss of 9%. From July 2014 to June 2015, it was 180 people. It's a loss, again, year over year, of 9%. From July 2015 to June 2016, the average attendance of Lakeside was 154 people. That's a loss of 14.5%. From July 2016 to June 2017, the average attendance of Lakeside was 136 people. That's a loss of 12%. From July 2017 to June 2018, the average attendance was 132 people. That's a loss of 3%. We couldn't stay the status quo and survive. The reality was, if we did nothing in 15 years, Lakeside would be gone. It would be gone. In that five-year span of consecutive losses, we lost 39% of people who were part of Lakeside. 39% in that five-year span. Look around and count 10 people. And now decide which four you want to be gone. That's the reality. This is what we're dealing with. And why do we care about that? The reason we care about that is because every single number represents a soul. These are people who either need a relationship with Jesus or have a relationship with Jesus who are now using their God-given gifts to impact people elsewhere. And we are missing out on that blessing. Not that we're trying to compete with other churches, but we are missing out on that blessing of seeing God work in and through their lives, seeing them pour into other people in a community that so desperately needs the hope of Jesus. Here we are, and this is what we found ourselves in. That almost four in ten people... 39% of people who called Lakeside home 
in a five-year span were gone. It's unacceptable. We can't live like that. These are souls that we're talking about. And so we found ourselves in a situation where we had to change. We had to do things differently. From July of 2018 to June of 2019, the average attendance of Lakeside was 136 people. For the first time in five years, we've seen growth. It's 3%. We're not happy about it. We're not thrilled about it, but we've stopped the bleeding. We're just getting started. For the first time in six years, we didn't lose more people than we gained. We're excited by this progress, but we're not content. We're not happy. And let's be clear, since we're being honest, not everyone has embraced the changes we needed to make. People have left because the sound's a little bit louder, because the lights are a little bit darker, because we got rid of the bulletin. People have left because they don't like me. That's reality. The average age of people who left Lakeside because of changes in this past year was 63 years old. That's the average age of people who left Lakeside because of the changes that we made. The average age of people who've started coming to Lakeside in the last year is 25 years old. The median age of Kiwani County is 38 years old. The median age of Lakeside is 42 and a half. Now, I know that there could be this thought from people who may not have had the opportunity to hear my heart or people who haven't had the opportunity to sit down with me or for whatever reason, and they could, they could think, you know, this church doesn't care about old people. And I'm just going to tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. But here's the reality. of people who make a decision to follow Jesus, 98% of people who make a decision to follow Jesus do so before they're 30 years old. 98%. And so as a result, we're going to position ourselves to reach those people. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm launching a new business, I'm the guy that's going to target the 98% of the market as opposed to the 2% of the market. And it doesn't mean that I don't care about the 2% of the market. It just means I'm going to go where 98% of the market is because I'm going to have a lot more impact there than I am trying to chase after the 2% of the market. And here's what you have to understand. Our message will never, ever, ever change. Our message will never change. Our methods always will. So long as I have the privilege of leading this church, our message will never change. But our methods always will. And we will look for ways to impact more people. We will look for ways to try to help more people who have no hope be introduced to the life and soul-altering hope of a relationship with Jesus. We will look for more ways to impact people who have a relationship with Jesus but aren't utilizing their gifts. And we will pour in to, to opportunities to provide them outlets that they can move one step closer to Jesus. I don't want anybody to leave. But if it's over the mission, I'm okay with it. It's not my goal. It's not that I'm like, oh, this is great. But if you can't get on board with what we're doing, you're more upset over the fact that we've changed 
than you are that 39% of people who called Lakeside home are no longer here in a span of five years. And I feel like you missed it. And this isn't speaking at you. It's not preaching at you. It's just saying we want to be in tune with the heart of Jesus. And I'm not saying you have to love everything that we've done and everything that we've changed. I don't love everything that we've done and everything that we've changed. But it's not about me. It must be. And it always will be about reaching people. That's what drives us. That's why methods change. But our message doesn't. And that's why we have to be driven by mission. We must be driven by mission. And so here's where we're going. And we're going to flesh this out over the next, the next four weeks. So if you're mad today, if you're like, ah, just listen. Give us the next four weeks, all right? Give us the next four weeks. Nobody gets to be mad after today, okay? But give us the next four weeks. And then if you're really mad, then let's meet and let's talk about it. Here's the deal. I respond to every criticism we get, every question we get. If there's a name on the card. I've told the team, if it's anonymous, I don't even want to see it because there's nothing I can do. And so some of you might, not, might be really mad and have been really mad for a really long time. And been like, well, nobody's talking to me and I don't, they don't care about me. It's because you didn't put your name on the card. You could be like, Brian's the dumbest person ever. Sign John. And I'll be like, hey, John. I don't know about ever. I mean, granted, there's, you know, I mean, let's... Let's not get carried away here. I'm not saying every idea I have is great, but, but let's talk about it. If you have a concern, if you have a question, and you put your name on the card, I will talk to you, and I want to hear your perspective. But if you're dropping anonymous bombs, sorry, I don't even see them, whether, whether good or bad. And you might be like, nobody's writing good anonymous. Maybe. Let's, like, let's hope, all right? But I, I don't see those either because there's nothing I can do about it. All I can do is panic about it or freak out about it or, or be upset. But if, if somebody's like, hey, here's my issue, then let's talk about it. Here's where we're going, and this is what we're going to flesh out over the next four weeks. First, as some of you know, we are engaged right now with a national search firm to expand our staff team. And we are looking to strategically hire a worship arts pastor. Second, the expansion of the team is not going to stop there. We are also announcing today for the first time that Lakeside Community Church is engaging in a process to bring in a family life pastor as well. And third, since 98% of people make the decision to follow Jesus before they're 30, we are going to continue our efforts on expanding our children's and student ministry. The renovations that were just completed a few months ago were a start. But it's just that, a start. In conjunction with bringing in a family life pastor, we are announcing that in the next year we are going to have plans drawn up and we are going to start the conversation to you to bring about phase two of the building of Lakeside Community Church. We are in right now what was originally designed to be phase one of a three-phase building. But along the way, this just became the building. And we are going to start the process of looking once again at advancing and enlarging our footprint. Why? So that we can have better programming for our kids and students. So that we can have increased meeting spaces. Why? Because we're a community. We're not a business. 
so that people can come and utilize the resources here. We're going to look at increased office spaces. And there are some other cool things that we're going to talk about in the weeks to come that we're looking at in the building expansion. That's where we're heading. Because I believe, and I firmly believe this, that the best days of Lakeside are ahead. But what that requires is for us to buy in. It requires us to not rest on the laurels of the past. It requires us to say, there are some things that I personally, I'm not the biggest fan of. That's okay. Because the mission, the mission is something I can rally about. The mission is something that I can get excited about. So we're asking you to buy in. To, yes, celebrate and embrace what Lakeside has done. But understand, the best days are yet to come. And we can be even more, even more excited about what God is going to continue to do. But listen. Following Jesus is never a comfortable experience. And so it's going to rattle us. And we're going to have to step out in faith. And it's going to shake us a little bit. And that's okay. Because that's where we need to live as followers of Jesus. Second. I want you to buy in if, if you feel like, well, Lakesides, they've left me behind, or they've, they've done all these things, and I'm not, not a fan of any of them. Well, here's what I, wanna, I, I really want you to think about. Is how are you serving? Are you plugged in? Are you pouring into other people? Are you using the gifts that God has given you? And I get that, that some of you, as a result of just helping, helping us stay above water, you're tired. And that's okay. And if you're tired and you're exhausted, then take a break from some things. But don't quit. Don't stop. And it can look like, you know, I, I might be heading this up and I don't want to head this up anymore. That's great, but don't quit. Keep using your gift set. Don't stop. And lastly, we're asking you to continue to support financially. We're asking you to continue to support by using the network that you have and leveraging your friends and your family and your connections and telling them about this place. And the last piece of this puzzle that we're going to ask you to do today is pray. I'm asking each and every one of you to make a five-week commitment today. And that is at least once a day for the next five weeks to pray that the mission would be realized that we would see lives changed. And that the best days of Lakeside would be ahead, not behind. The methods will always change. The message never will. God, I pray that you would be honored and glorified in this place. Help us see things the way that you see things. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Let us run into the areas that other people would turn up their nose and shake their heads.
Let us see lives that are changed. That's what we ask. Help us focus on the mission. And I pray that all of us would play a part. Be glorified. Thank you, God, for choosing to use us. Use us in ways we can't even imagine, we ask. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.